It is my distinct honor to introduce our moderator for this evening, Howard Tolman, who happens to be the CEO of 1871. Um, Howard is uh, overseeing just a dramatic transformation of the space of 1871, and I think in large part due to his particular leadership. And this is the place where digital startups come to, to start, build, and grow their businesses. Um, he's also the general managing partner of G2T3V LLC and of Chicago High Tech Investment Partners. He is a member of Mayor Emanuel Chicago Next and the Cultural Affairs Councils, the Innovate Illinois Advisory and Arts Councils, a member of President Preckwinkle's New Media Council, an adjunct professor at Kellogg, and an advisor to many, many startups. He is also the former chairman and CEO of Tribeca Flashpoint College and Kendall College. And over the last 48 years, he has successfully founded more than a dozen high-tech companies. Um, as you can imagine, I could go on and on because there are many other things on his bio that have not been included on here. I think um, one that's worth mentioning and very important and why he's our moderator this evening is um, there are very few people in this world that have had the opportunity to address the United Nations and stand on the floor of the General Assembly. And Howard had that distinct honor. And he got to choose one topic to talk about. And the topic that he chose was unconscious bias. And so he single-handedly elevated this very important topic to a very large international audience. And so we're very pleased and honored to have him join us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'll just use this. Thank, thank you, Holly. Welcome. Uh, how many people have not been to 1871 before? Oh, not so bad. Okay. So in three minutes or less, 1871, year of the Chicago Fire, a little bit like naming your new enterprise Titanic Inc., a little confusing, <laughs> but post the fire, which destroyed about half the city, there was an enormous renaissance, and the city was rebuilt, the skyscraper was invented, uh, the Ferris wheel was invented, that important food group, the Twinkie, was conceived around that time. Uh, about six years ago, we thought that technology represented that kind of an opportunity for the city. At that time, technology businesses were less than 2% of the Chicago economy today. About 14% are technology businesses. 1871 has created about 10,000 new jobs. We have 2,000 people a day here and about 500 companies uh, basically inventing the future. Uh, we're proud of a lot of different things. We have more than 800 volunteer mentors, and last month we achieved an astonishing thing. We have more female mentors than male mentors, uh, and this year they'll provide 10,000 hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching. So uh, that's one of the things that we do, but basically what we try to do is just uh, use these new technologies to create opportunities across the board. Uh, and in just about every industry you could imagine. So tonight we're gonna talk about uh, unconscious bias and we have an amazing panel. Uh, Holly already read way too much of my bio, so I'm just going to take a different approach. I'm gonna ask the panel to come up and then we're gonna ask them individually to give them a little uh, background. Uh, and then we'll get into some questions. We have uh, a system here that permits you to submit questions and then uh, other people can sort of vote the questions up. And what this does is it makes, uh, it makes it a little easier to make sure that we're answering the questions that are most on the mind of most of the people. So you'll see the information on the monitors. Uh, and we'll have about 45 minutes or so of uh, the panel and then we'll open it for questions. And again, if you use the system and also if you do us the courtesy because we're recording, uh, of waiting until we get a microphone in front of you, then the microphone will pick up uh, your questions and it'll all be part of the, uh, the evening's presentation. So on that note, uh, why don't you guys come on up and uh, I'm gonna sit here, I think. So Dory, can I start with you? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, I have followed you. So, Dory, why don't you start? start. <clears throat> so I'm Dory McWhorter. I'm the CEO of the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago. And just a little about my background I joined the YWCA 
almost five years ago, and I was before that, I was a partner at a public accounting firm, so I feel like I'm amongst my people, given that my background is heavily um, accounting and, and a little bit of consulting, so a little on the technology area as well. Okay, Irina. Irina Konstantinovsky, I am the head of HR at Horizon Pharma. I've been there for two months. Uh, and two days, who's counting? <laughs> um, prior to that, I was five years uh, at Baxter Healthcare uh, here in Chicago, and prior to that, I was a consultant for 15 years in the HR and talent arenas. Great. Anna? I'm Anna Cates, and I'm the Director of Computational Sciences at the Center for Women's Health Research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health. And um, I was trained originally as, as like a biomedical scientist, but became very curious about why women and racial like minorities never didn't make it to leadership positions, didn't make it to faculty positions, didn't make it essentially out of the student pipeline into the professor, and um, started sort of studying that and, and taking a data science approach to it. Um, so my research program now really focuses on understanding and addressing reasons why women and racial like minorities remain um, you know, disproportionately underrepresented um, in higher ranking and leadership positions, not just in science, but across many fields. OK. <laughs> so we're going to ask you to start with giving us just a basic definition, if you would. Oh, of you're looking at me. Okay. Of, of unconscious bias. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was talking about this earlier. So I, th like, I think it's really important to like, go back and understand where the term unconscious bias sort of came from. And so I um, am lucky enough to work with Patricia Devine. She is a social psychologist, and her dissertation project at Ohio State University essentially identified the possibility that people's conscious beliefs, conscious egalitarian beliefs, could actually um, conflict with their automatic thinking. So before this time, like there, you know, like, like people had thought about prejudice as um, this thing that you could control. You know, like if I, if I, if I like force myself to be, you know, like, like nice to women and nice to minorities, like, like then, you know, I'm not gonna be prejudiced. So people really thought you had like the sort of like control of it, conscious control. And her work showed that, you know, even when you have conscious, you know, egalitarian beliefs, you can have implicit biases or unconscious biases going on. Because we're constantly bombarded by images and messages telling us, you know, what women are like, what blacks are like. And even though we might not agree with that, that's all going into our brain. And it's making us um, you know, sort of be able to link certain things together, like white men in science. <laughs> um, so I don't know what the question was, no, but, okay. yeah, but, but I think it's like important <clears throat> to kind of go back and, and just realize that you know, like, like Title, you know, Title VI you know, made it illegal for institutions of higher education that accept federal funds to discriminate on the basis of somebody's race. You know, that was 1966. Title IX was passed in 1972, did the same thing for sex. And people thought in time, you know, like we'll have just as many women as men, you know, in all of these fields, in business, in medicine, whatever. We'll have sort of like, you know, parity with people by, you know, race, ethnicity too. And it, it didn't happen. And, and nobody like knew why. They're like, well, we've been explicitly telling you not to be biased against women, <laughs> you know? And, and so like sort of this whole revolutionary thing happened that really changed thinking. And like when Trish talks about her study, she thought she was wrong. She kept rerunning her models because like, you know, everybody was so sure that prejudice was conscious, like consciously controllable. You know, she, she was, you know, so she had to dig back like 40, 40 50 years into work, you know, that sort of aligned with, you know, what she was finding that had sort of been dismissed by the whole like social psychology community, you know, so. So you hear, you hear, you hear <laughs> like all the time. history of unconscious No, that, no yeah. actually, you hear all the time that technology is neutral. And, you know, we think, I mean, 
when we see the words unconscious bias, it seems to me we think of that almost automatically of having a negative, con you know, sort of uh, component to it as if people just understand it. Is it, is it preventable? Is it relearnable? Yeah. yeah, so I think, um, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to explain it. But, like, as I was saying, you know, we're all sort of like bombarded by images and messages all the time, sort of telling us that, you know, men are agentic or they're action oriented, they're independent, they're logical. Women are communal, they're kind, they're compassionate. Blacks are good, you know, at, at athletics. You know, Hispanics are social. Asians aren't good in leadership. You know, like we have, whether we agree with them or not. And, um, and what we see happening is like, even with people who consciously have like egalitarian beliefs, you know, Joe Handelsman has a really good study showing, you know, that they took a resume. It was the same resume. They put a male name on it and they put a female name on it. They sent, to, they sent it around to a random sample of professors around the country across science fields. Same resume, same qualifications. <laughs> professors, regardless of gender or rank, were more likely to want to hire the man. They wanted to pay him a higher salary. They were more likely to want to give him mentoring. It, and it, it's like, how could that happen? You know, and it's like it happens because you have this whole other process happening in your brain, you know, that that's absolutely like impacting your decision making. And as a scientist, it's like it's really fascinating, <laughs> you know, to, to sort of like want to unpack that, you know. And, and, and so there's, you know, like like research has really transformed to like how do we get at those implicit biases? And, and, and if you just sort of like stop and think about it, how did you get them to begin with? You got them to begin with by sort of being inundated by all of these sort of like, you know, billboards showing like women with babies and, you know, like, like men with hammers or, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you know, and, and so, so it's like, like you have to retrain your implicit biases. And so like, like there's a lot of different strategies that you can do for that. You can, you know, do, I was talking earlier about like, you know, stare, like, um, counter stereotype imaging is like one thing you can do where it's like, you know, if you're, if you're sort of like evaluating people for a position and like traditionally the position would have been held by like a white man, if you visualize before you're, you know, interviewing people, you know, a, a black woman CEO, you know, somebody in a counter stereotype group, feed that information into your brain, it can actually make a big difference. So there's things like that, you know, and I think like like, I think this is a huge public health issue. I mean, like, we're losing women and minorities to such an extent that we're no longer, like, competitive in the global economy for science and technology. This is a crisis. It absolutely is a crisis. And I think, you know, media is playing a major, major role. Like, if we had television showing, like, women scientists in positive ways, blacks, like, not as criminals, but as, like, leaders, you know, that would absolutely help to, to change people's implicit biases because they would be, you know, sort of bombarded by images that are not, you know, really in one direction. <clears throat> so that's way too much of an answer, no, that's probably. Okay. But so, <laughs> so let me ask you one question. I, th I think what you said was that the professors who decided on the male resume were both male and female professors? Yeah, yeah. So is it, I mean, is it impacting female professors just as much? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. But I mean, we're all bombarded by the same stuff. Of course it does. Like male, men and women, blacks and whites. Um, I don't know if some of you've heard about the implicit association test. It's housed at Harvard and essentially it's like a computer mediated task that, that tests how quickly you can associate sort of counter stereotype things like black and academia, you know, and, and like, um, like, like stereotype congruent things like white and academia or something, you know, you can like check it out if you haven't seen it. But, you know, like looking at that, looking at the data, population level data, not just from the US, but, but internationally shows, you know, that blacks have implicit bias against blacks. You know, women have implicit bias against women in science careers. And it's like, oh yeah, I mean, just because you're a woman, you're not immune to it, you know? It, it, and I think that's one of the humbling things is like, it's like it, everybody does it. Like we all sort of like are co-conspiring, <laughs> you know, together, like, like you know, and, and sort of maybe it's against our awareness, but I think we all have to recognize that, you know, and another thing too is like, so stereotype-based bias, it doesn't just impact the way that, you know, people evaluate you and behave towards you. It impacts your personal decision-making. 
So, so like we see, you know, women and men who are similarly qualified, like the woman will feel like she's less qualified. Why? It's not true. It's because like you know, you've been fed all this information that you're not supposed to be in science. You're supposed to be like home. <laughs> you know, so, so I mean, so it's important to sort of look at that. And, and when you look at like what needs to happen, you can't just have an intervention focused on sort of building people's efficacy to cope with bias or like changing, you know, evaluators, um, like decision making to be less biased. You have to have a multi-level approach or else it's not gonna do anything. And there's tons and tons of money that's just being wasted because you don't have you know, like, like in, you know, institutional interventions, department level interventions, interpersonal interventions, and, you know, and, and personal level interventions. Because it, it takes that approach. Sorry, okay, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. okay. So, <laughs> so let's bring it to the present day. And, and Dory, tell us you know, how this kind of stuff and these attitudes manifest themselves in, in your day to day, and, and particularly if you would, I you know if I recall I may have dreamed this up, but I recall an initiative around female drivers for Uber. Why why don't we talk about that a little bit too? Because you know if you listen to Uber, their position is overall that they have extended transportation opportunities, they've created jobs, they've created a level of access and things in, let's say, this, the south half of this entire city uh, in an astonishing way. And, and you guys were a big part of that as well, so. Sure, so I, I, I just realized that we were, we sat in order of least scientific knowledge. And so <laughs> I'm no, going to no, give. No, we haven't. No. So I'm going to give all personal anecdotes. It's called with, status leveling. Okay. <laughs> That's the type of bias. So, that is. so <laughs> having said that, so I should I should preface these remarks by saying that the mission of the YWCA is to eliminate racism and empower women. And so, as I mentioned, I became CEO five years ago, and we're a 140 year old organization. And so, my my position has been that that this needs to end at some point, right? That at some point we need to work ourselves out of business. And so one of the things that we've been very upfront about is thinking of new ways to be creative, to essentially address the systemic issues on a number of different levels. And so what Howard is referring to specifically is that we partner with, with Uber about two or three years ago now that um, we wanted to create um, a larger pool of women drivers for a number of reasons. One, to access the opportunities. We wanted the flexible work arrangements that the Uber as a shared ride service was, a, was providing for our women. And through that initiative, Chicago actually is the largest, has the largest percentage of women drivers across the country at about 30%. When we first, our goal was to get 5,000 women in a year through this initiative and, and the excellent partnership that we have with Uber, we were able to get 15,000 within like the first nine months. Wow. And so that really spoke to one, the, the access. So when we talk about multidimensional interventions, um, partly for us as we look to really eliminate racism and empower women and say, how do we do that? We know that it's just not one thing. We have to sort of um, make sure that we're doing things that get us over the hump of all the other institutional barriers that are there, as well as ensure that our programming are looking at people People, um, that have traditionally been marginalized. And I just have to say, with so much of what Anna is saying, I, while I don't always use the data to talk about it through clearly lived experience and just perspectives that I've gained by trying to actually affect this work, I second a thousand things that you said. So, And I'm sure we'll you get too. into more of that. Yeah. So. <laughs> so tell us about, Arena, from the standpoint of talent and attracting talent, what you know? What do you face? You know, it's interesting because of the resume example from before. Your job is to recruit and bring in diverse and uh, you know, sort of across the board talent. But you are accountable to the people that are going to work with these people and that are designing the specs and the opportunities. You know, how does that impact your ability to present candidates? And also, by the way, just to attract candidates. And to attract candidates. I, I, you know, the, the, the biases and, and potential biases in the recruiting process, I think it's one of the most studied ones in, in, in corporate America. And, and uh, there's a great example, just backtracking for a second, there's a great example that many of you might be familiar, which is the, the orchestras. And um, until 1970, 5% uh, of musicians in, in the American orchestras were women, and, and you know, now it's north of 30% of, of musicians are, are women, and it's not like the spec change, or it's not like um, the number of, of musicians change. What changed was that they did blind 
auditions. So um, these people were auditioning behind a screen and you, didn't, you couldn't tell if it was a woman or a man doing the audition. So uh, you try to apply some of those things into, into the workplace and start to think about, you know, there's been practices around blinding resumes and can you take the names out of resumes to uh, mitigate some of those biases. I think those are good programmatic elements. They tend to fall short, A, because it's not holistic, and two, because uh, if you think about sort of the recruiting process at some point, you're going to meet the candidates. And at some point, it's who apply to the jobs as well, and, and what happens with people who are not applying for jobs because they don't feel qualified. We're back to, you know, if there's 10 qualifications for a job, we hear, you know, a man who has two or three believes he's qualified to do that job. A woman who has eight of those qualifications, there's research that shows that believes she's not qualified to do the job and doesn't apply to the job. That applies to internal promotions. I mean, I can go on and on. You know, I, I worked in the talent space for years and been part of countless talent conversations where you decide who's going to be in the special project, in the next challenging assignment, in the succession plan for a particular role. And if a woman is not ready, we deem, you know, and I was part of those discussions where you decide, you know, you sort of decide that if a woman is a great performer, absolutely ready. On potential, mm, she might not have the right qualifications. You, you put your bets much easier on men than you do on women. And those are uh, unconscious biases that we have to unpack in the workplace. So <clears throat> I was just with uh, the, the retiring uh, CEO of American Express mm -hmm. last week. And when he took the job, he was one of three African-American CEOs in the entire United States. I don't know how many years he served, 20 years, 18 years, something. As when he retires, there will be a grand total of three African American CEOs in the, and they can't even understand this. They, I mean, literally the group of executives that were there can't understand it. But what ultimately came out, and it was both the head of uh, AT and T and uh, the head of Amex, was they said that if you want this stuff to change, you have to force the change. And and what they are literally doing is they're tying compensation to pure metrics. It's like, if you don't have 14% or 25% of women or African Americans or whatever it is in the workforce at the end of this reporting period, uh, we're going to penalize you. And they think that that's the only way that this is gonna be accomplished. And I don't, I don't know, you know, we haven't seen proof of that. Yeah. Uh, and we also haven't seen how much pressure additionally that puts on the people. This is the famous affirmative action sort of, you know, conversation. But I think that that's probably what it's going to take. I, I think that there's no way, but you know. I don't know what's going to happen. Not to interrupt you, yeah. but it's like, like with affirmative action, the government tried to fix bias with statistics. And, and what happened? Like women and minorities were, you know, got into college and people treated them in really, really negative ways. You're only here, you know. I mean, I, I can see that. That's exactly. We've already done this, right. you know. Like, like the minorities and women that are going to be hired, are going to be like ostracized. Like, you're only you're taking a white man's job, you know. We've already been through that. Well, what's a better <laughs> what's a better solution? What's I mean, a, what's I think a it's a really a really good question. And I was just like sort of reflecting on kind of like side note, your story about the so the orchestra study. So there was sort of like the, the sort of middle event in the orchestra study where they blinded auditions, but like the clicking of women's high heels <laughs> was enough information to, to, to recreate the same bias. But when they figured that out, so like they had to have people like be barefoot, <laughs> you know, or something, but just like, like it takes very little information, you know, to, to, to sort of to trigger to bias and stuff. And so, I mean, so just sort of like reflecting, it, you, you need a holistic pro like process and people are like oh my god it's going to be so much work and it's it's like no you're just i mean it, it really it just it's it's necessary i think you can view it however you want but like like one of the main things you know that happens is is this thing called semantic priming so semantic priming is like where you know you have criteria for a job right like leadership ability independence whatever and and like what do those words more strongly align with, women or men? Men, okay, so what type of men? White men. <laughs> so, so white men are gonna see that and implicitly, they're gonna be more likely to, to apply to it. And then they're gonna be more likely to be, you know, like selected to go on the job. 
And, and that, that is just, it, it's like very basic. But I mean, if you look at any research on like semantic priming, it's this, it's, it's huge, you know, and I, I like, like, I, I know you're a wonderful person, but I just like, like <laughs> HR, <laughs> I mean, like, like HR, ha, it, you know, is, is based on heuristics. HR is like, well, these are our best practices, and there's no science behind any of it. You know, and so like, like as, a, as like a scientist, like we go in now, like we're partnering with like IMSA and Argonne and all these places to, to bring a social science lens in to these environments to actually design criteria that will be, you know, like, like that won't sort of prime people to overselect for white men, you know, that sort of thing. And I mean, and the same thing happens with like promotion criteria, you know, evidence of, you know, being a leader, like, like you're going to, you know, all of it, <laughs> you over, you, it's going to select for white men, even if objective information, like, like, you know, objective information, like, like, you know, the woman and the man had maybe done the same level of work. It doesn't matter. People are going to see it differently, you know, and, and I just wanted to say another thing, too, is like, you know, like why women and minorities, like, they're more reluctant to apply for anything is because, I mean, we have really clear studies showing they are held to higher standards. It takes more objective examples of your ability when you're a woman or you're a minority in a white male dominated field for people to confirm that you have competence. You know, and we have really clear experiment, like really like experimental studies showing this. We know it happens. Actually, yeah. that's, that's only, <clears throat> you know, that's about half of, of that analysis. The other half that's even more scary because of the culture here is all about failing fast. The stakes of failure for anybody are other high. than the white are much higher. Yeah. I mean, de demonstrably well, it, higher. It's like the Because there's no tolerance, study. right? Well, no, it just takes, because people are expecting women and minorities to fail, it takes less proof of like incompetence to confirm incompetence. And so, but, but for, for like white men, it's like really interesting. They can be like super incompetent, no offense, you know? <laughs> and, and like, you know, like, like there's studies showing like, you know, men, like, you know, they did all these things wrong or whatever, but at the end of the day, it, it's, you know, because it takes so much more proof to confirm incompetence in men because you're like, oh no, like they're, they're gonna be the next CEO, you know, like. Yes, and it's a complex system at work, right? I, I, you know, I, I read a study recently that um, Bain did, and they do an analogy that I kind of like because of the, of the holistic nature of, of the analogy, which is sort of the, the, the climber and being a great climber, and, and maybe it resonates because my husband just climbed Kilimanjaro, and the toughest part about climbing was not the physical skills uh, that mental. were required, but it was the mental stamina and kind of being in a mountain for 10 days without electricity, you know, very if you have enough food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was sort of the psychological aspect of it. And I was thinking about, um, you know, I was thinking about these because we have, you know, more women graduating college than men. We have 40% of MBA graduates being women and still they don't make it to the top. So something about what we do in the terrain really gets in the way, in the way of, of women progressing. And it's, it's both sort of what the organization does as well as sort of the discouragement that, that women face, right? You have Jeff and Anna applying for a job and they're both qualified to do the job, but you know, Jeff is discussing this position with who might be potentially her boss at the sports um, bar when they, after work, had a drink. Anna had a formal meeting to discuss you know, the pros and cons of taking this position. Because the future manager cares, he asked Anna four times, are you going to be okay with all this travel, given that you have two, two small kids? Jeff has the same two small kids. These things are at work all the time and, and, and just, you know, reinforce a process that, you know, Dory. in sorry. and out. No, I'm sorry. <coughs> Part of the reason I, the, this question just um, resonates with me, because in the accounting profession, um, particularly, one of the roles that I, I'm still very active in the accounting profession, so I um, sit on the board of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Illinois CPA Society, and this is an issue from a diversity perspective that we're really trying to address. And I actually think that this question around, and by the way, we've been trying to address it for years in the industry. I've been, I've been spent 20 plus years in the accounting field, and 20 plus years later, we're still talking about it. We're actually having a reunion in a couple of weeks from my alma mater at Anderson because we were on the minority recruiting 
to commission back then. Um, so what I've seen is that we're looking, we're, we're trying to take the easy way out. And so when I hear the quota conversation, it is the easy way out because accountants have the same, we have the same issue. The reality is that I think that we need to be more creative and ask different questions. If you ask a question in terms of how do we get more diversity, you're going to get quotas. If you ask the question truly around how do we get best performance and what do you need to, inst to, to what does that need to look like, I think that you drive towards a more diverse answer because you cannot continue to do the same thing and increase performance and improve performance. What we saw in the accounting profession, particularly, and it's surprising given in a city like Chicago, when I was, um, so I was a partner at a top 10 accounting firm, I was the only black female partner in the whole city. And, and that was in 2008 when I became partner. And so that just shows you that there is a dearth of that profession. And we can go across any of the STEM professions and you're going to see the same thing. We, as accountants and lawyers, we used to have this discussion all the time, who has less black people? And we used to win um, all the time. Um, and I think it's the, the math piece, right? And talk about discrimination. I think it's the, the math and the stereotypes around math. But what I do think, we need to be very creative. If metrics works for your organization, then yes, you need to use quotas. If it doesn't work for your organization or you need to accomplish a different objective, you need to spend time figuring out what that objective is and ask different questions. If you continue to ask, how do we get more diversity, you can get more diversity easy. What you can do, what ends up happening, they get different colors of the same person. So that's not necessarily diversity. So you'll get a black one and a Latino one, and you'll just diversify the color, but you haven't changed any of your thought perspective. That really, to me, leads to that increased performance that we think is the benefit. I also think that if we spend the time on on the HR side, spend the time really understanding sort of the, the, the preferences and the needs that we have from an employee standpoint, like we do on the marketing side of things. I think in marketing, we really try to understand the specificity of a customer's needs. We don't do that on the employee side. We want people to just sort of come in in a box and fill in that box. And I think that we need to look and be more creative around strategies, around what that really looks like to get true talent to do what we need it to, be, to get done. So, you know, you said an interesting thing, and, and here, the way we would phrase that is people ask all the time, you know, what rules do we have here with 2,000 people a day? And a long time ago, I mean, I said that we, we couldn't possibly have a workbook or a set of rules that was comprehensive enough. So we don't have rules of behavior. We have expectations of performance. And I think that's just what you said, which is get it done. And that's really the driver. It's not a head count. It's not a metrics thing. It, it's, it's not possible to get to the end result, which is really that you want improved performance. I mean, I, I think you know, there are so many of these examples. They, uh, you know, way back when, when they were designing, and Alan, you probably know this, the airbags, the, the model was a five foot eight dummy that was a man. And as a result, the first airbags killed a lot of kids and a lot of women right, right. because the way it deployed, and now they have a whole family that they use in order to, to do that. But I mean, this has been you know, a part of science as well for the, a really long time. I, you know, one of, the, one of the other questions is, what are the real you know, repercussions in terms, and you started to allude to this, that we're falling behind in science. We're not globally competitive. I mean, I think that when half the workforce is not in the consideration set, <coughs> You know, you have to be sort of killing your chances, and we just keep sort of losing in terms of uh, the positioning and the resources. So I, you know, my question again is is really, who's doing it well? Who's who ha have you seen any instances of people who have figured out? I mean, the you know the orchestra example is interesting to me because, you know, there's all kinds of business literature around the orchestra as a peculiar thing in that it's not hierarchical in a traditional sense. It's everybody is an independent professional, but they have to work collaboratively. It's a different model from a lot of sort of command and control structures. I mean, I get that there's a conductor, but those individuals have to be professional. They have to practice. They have to execute. And maybe that was a freer environment for more women who were talented to move into. I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, blind, blind testing is okay, but I'm not sure that ultimately, uh, even the results of that dictate what the environment turns out to be. And that's just the question. It's, you know, you can make somebody's life, you know, aggressively miserable in the in the context of a collaborative environment as well. So.
Go ahead. Interesting on that on that point that I think that we often think about what's the opportunity lost or what's the cost if we don't do these things. But I, I sort of lean on the side of opportunity and possibility, and it just not does not make sense to me that we can actually operate in a way that says we're going to ignore complete demographics and really believe that we are exploring or fully exploiting all the possibilities available to us, regardless of what a solution may be. You know, we would never, and that's why I continue to compare sort of the talent side to the marketing side. We wouldn't necessarily say we want to grow and improve our performance and ignore complete populations of the demographics from a marketing perspective. So I, you know, we were mentioning Melody Hobson earlier. I was in a room when she once said, why would you just not want to get more money? Like, why would you ignore black women wear makeup and not get more money? So why would you do that on a talent perspective as well? And I think that what we have to do is sort of really challenge these norms. And I, so I'm, I like things super simple. So I've actually come to the point of saying that why can't we just figure out a way, and I'm sure Anna will help me figure this out, but why can't we just figure out a way to help people understand that humans are variable? And that we, you know, we can solve for X and Y's in many different ways, but the reality of it is, is that um, I work for an organization now that 90% of the workforce is women, and that's partially how I'm now becoming, having all these epiphanies. And we try to treat them all the same because they're women. <laughs> They're not the same. So men, you're totally excused. Women are not the same, right? And so um, what we had to do is create different processes from an HR perspective to really um, engage with each woman to really understand what are their preferences. And so we, treat, we changed our processes. We now have um, our whole HR system is called um, Possibility Partners, Unleashing Purpose and Potential. And we're really trying to get down to how we treat people, not necessarily that we set up um, 150 different processes for everyone that works there, but at least having conversations to understand what makes their experience different working with us. Well, and this, this is what technology enables. It was not Absolutely. possible before. It's mass Absolutely. customization. And you actually can be all things to each person. I Absolutely. mean, if you invest the time in order to do that. Melanie had a great line last week. She said, if everybody in the organization is different, then no one is different. And the idea was that you know, if you really want to have a, an innovative environment, it has to be inclusive because you have Absolutely. to have uh, you have to have sort of all these inputs in order to be successful today. Yeah, there's some really good experimental stuff, like from Marcus Brower and Soad Marar that show. So, so like just they've had studies where they're trying to like reduce implicit bias against Muslims or blacks, and essentially like they've come up with these really easy harmless ambient interventions where if you simply show a poster of like you know all islamic people or like like a bunch of islamic people but they're doing different things your implicit bias against that group goes down because you're seeing that there's variation like or you're saying like you know just to give some science <laughs> like, like like thank you, you. Know, but, but, it, but it's true it's like like because think about it how stereotypes are like like you're like oh this group is this way mm -hmm. You know, but it's like, but if you're forced to see variation in a group, then you're like, oh yeah, <laughs> you know, they're like me, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. I had, I forgot, I had something else to say, but I don't remember what I was. All right. <laughs> Your comment, Dory, about you know we end up sometimes in corporate America at least with different shades of the same you know different shades of the same sort of leadership style and you know I think about sort of the quintessential uh, ask usually is can you can you assess that this person has fit in for the organization and I always question what does fit mean right does it mean that you know it, they might look different but do they act just you know do we are we all the same sort of person sort of in a in a in a different shade maybe color well and I mean there's Again, clear experimental evidence showing like the more ambiguous the criteria, the more likely you you are to you know, you know sort of like decide on the person who's traditionally been in that role, yep. you know because like you like if, if there's a lot of ambiguity, your stereotype based biases sort of implicitly fill in the gaps for you, like oh okay there's no proof of like the, of publishing but I'm sure <laughs> you know like in time he'll publish or or whatever I was just thinking like. Um, so a lot of my work is on like, you know, how to make people who haven't historically been scientists, scientists. And I'm just thinking about kind of what you were saying about like, you know, mentoring people and whatever. So like forever, you know, like, like white men were popping out as scientists like crazy. Success, success, success. And people were like, oh, like it's just, they're just intrinsically talented. 
And so we started and like, and then you know, minorities and women weren't making it. And they're like, so they're they're just intrinsically untalented, like they can't cut it. But when you start digging into the science of how to make a scientist, like how to make you know, a person in your organization successful, it's really interesting because what we found was that white men were, they were mentored. They were given opportunities. They had all this stuff sort of like all the deck was stacked for them and, and nobody was aware of it. It was totally implicit, you know, it, like, like going back to the resume study. And so, so like, you know, what we try to do is like, like dig into how do you make a scientist? What do you need? And now we know like you need mentoring, you need like professional development, you need like X, Y, and Z. And like for minorities, I mean, you also need coping skills to deal with the bias, you know, to survive and stuff too. So just to sort of like speak to that model, like I think that when we bring a science, like I'm a data scientist, when you bring a, like a scientific lens in and you say like, how do we, how do we make women into scientists? How do, you know, well, how, how do you do it, you know? Yeah, one of the um, so because this issue is so um, relevant for the accounting field for a number of reasons, and I'm sure like many of you with the, the professions that you're in, um, we just last week had Dr. Claude Steele um, from Stanford University. And He's it's hard to get. That's amazing. Yeah, well, we had a little intimate group with him, so it was amazing. <laughs> But it's but his field of study is stereotypes, and he's from Chicago, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. he's from Chicago. Um, so his book, he wrote a book called Whistling Vivaldi, and so what he did, because he was on the south side of Chicago and recognized that there was about this this black man um, who started whistling Vivaldi because it made white people less intimidated when they walked by, um, when he walked by, or they walked by. Either way, they both walked by each other. Um, and so one of the things that he raised my <clears throat> awareness around, like we talk a lot about the unconscious bias. But he also talked about stereotype threat and the yeah. fact that, for example, in your examples, as you said, Anna, that is I as a black woman, if I had been more aware of the stereotypes around um, black women in math, I may not have ever pursued a degree in accounting, right? Fortunately, I don't listen to people or listen to anything. Yeah. So I was just in my own little world, so I did my own thing. But having said that, I think that that's a very real pressure because I absolutely, we, I went to University of Wisconsin, Madison, yeah. <laughs> um, and that I felt all of that stereotype threat, particularly as I also learned in 2006 that um, 10 years, or like I graduated in 95, so I'm, I'm telling my age, but I was at a job in 2006 and I was told I was the last black person who had to graduate out of the accounting program at that time. So I felt that when I was at that oh, university. Really, yeah. um, so my only point is, is that I think that we have to address those stereotypes, but I don't, from a scientific perspective, I'm sure there's definitely interventions we can do, but this is where I do think that people have personal accountability into recognizing and being who they are. We talked about the bias being there, yeah. and bias occurs because of our sort of learned experiences, but we control those experiences to some degree. So I'm very mindful of the groups that I interact with because I don't want to continue um, to kind of get that same information. There was a study that Pew Research had done that showed that 80% of white folks on Facebook had friends that were also white. 70% black folks on Facebook had friends that were also black and 60% of Latino. So the reality is we are all keeping similar circles, but until we sort of consciously make a decision to change that, I absolutely think that that has an impact on our ability to shift where our unconscious bias. Now this is again me, we'll ask the scientists and, <laughs> and the folks that look at this all the time, but I do think that there is some personal accountability that we yeah. have to have in expanding our networks and expanding our presence in places to get different data points that, that form those biases, yeah. I should say. I, I, so let me just ask Anna, what do you what do? Um, you do? Well, thank you, Dima. <laughs> I have a fan, thank you, what Dima. Do you, <laughs> what, do you, what do you do organizationally? Let's move it to you know, what, what concrete actions, I mean, what <laughs> remedies or what sort of protocols do you put in place? Let's say you see the behavior, you realize it's destructive or it's interfering with the growth of the organization or the ability to get talented people. How, you know, how do you take the next step? I mean, I think that's the real question. In, and it, if it starts in large organizations, I almost think it has to start there. And the reason is, it's just too easy in a in a business that has ten people not to not, yeah. you know not to address it. It's just too you know central. Yeah, um, you know, I, I many many organizations are doing training around this. I actually think it's a great effort, not enough for sure, but they're they're definitely raising the awareness and and people start to recognize and and the science behind unconscious bias is so strong that you. Um, you know, if, if you go to the website of the Implicit Project at Harvard and you take some of those tests, you go like, what? Like, I have huge biases. 
you know, and, and there's a science behind it. So if you can train people to show that this is happening, I think it's a good start and many organizations are doing that. Then you, have, then you can do some programmatic things and, and really change some of your policies, whether it's you know, blinding resumes where you can do that, uh, to really unpacking some of what organizational fit means, means in the organization, looking at your pay equity. Um, you know, equity is a huge thing in organizations. Some states have uh, now banned the ability of recruiters, which is a nightmare to ask how much were you, pay, were you being paid in your prior job. And the, that is all based on the perspective of, you know, we're still reinforcing, you know, women come with less, negotiate less salaries, and then they, they go to the next job based on the last job they had. So uh, you can do some programmatic things like that. But I think organizations fall short in general to do the third and most important step, which is to bring the culture along. You put the policies in place, you put the training in place, but then senior leaders and, and many in the organization tend to reinforce some of the biases at work by, you know, by doing things that maybe are unconscious, maybe are conscious, but sort of in, in the fast moving pace of, of the organizations. You know, just uh, leave unattended the fact that decisions get made in the golf course, in big organizations, and um, uh, you know who gets promoted and who doesn't get promoted is based on on many other things other than the qualifications of the individual. Tori, I would add that um, I don't think we have we can't ignore the impact that who we do business with matters. Um, one of my favorite companies, and we all just honored last week, is McDonald's. And the reason that they're one of my favorite companies is one, they've they've sent they've ten they have explicitly made diversity part of who they are and how they do things from the top of the organization to, to the field. So for example, McDonald's is one of four Fortune 500 companies that has a board that's 50% diverse, diverse. I don't know why I can that diverse. Divorce. Not divorce, <laughs> diverse. <laughs> diverse. Yeah. Don't know what about anything about their boards in real life, but, the, but diverse yeah. um, with women and people of color. So, and then they also have a workforce of 1.9 million people. It's extremely diverse. They have the most diverse supply chain and the most diverse franchise owner network. And so for them, diversity is part of how they increase their business and gain revenue. So I do think that you have to look outside in at the same time you're looking inside out to really understand who you're doing business with, how your diversity matters to the people you do business with, and vice versa. So we can't just... I, I think that there's lots of things that we need to focus on from an opportunity and, and idea and innovation perspective, but also very putting real measurements around how we're doing business and who we're doing business to and how we access different business channels because of the people that we have internally. And I think that there are large scale examples like organizations like McDonald's, who is one, by the way, one we talk about, particularly in Chicago, a lot about that youth and violence and how jobs can help that. McDonald's is one of the largest employer of black youth. And so I just think that we need to look at these models and understand what works for your organization, but you have to look at it, I think, across the entire value, value chain, including your customers, your supply chain, and also the people that you work with so that it's very holistic in your thinking. Yeah. So I'm going to um, start to see if we have any questions, because I want to save some time for the questions, but let's talk about the next generation. What do you think we can do in the schools? What do you think we can do Let's assume we're already all screwed, but is there, you know, <laughs> is there something that we can do for the, the kids who are in high school, and maybe that's even too late in the scheme of things, well, we're, to start we're doing it? that. Are we? <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> so we have bias reduction interventions um, that have been randomized control trials um, that, that we've you know, had in university settings. Um, and we're also bringing them into high school settings and into like national labs. And essentially, um, you know, we know if you just raise awareness, it's actually harmful because people start trying to repress their prejudice and they don't know how to act around somebody who's black and they're, they're just like, they just freak out. <laughs> I mean, it's not funny, but, but you know, it, it makes things worse. And so you have to give them strategies and, and also motivation. I mean, like another thing is like you have to motivate people want you need to motivate them to want to change their like cognitive processing and to want to change their like behavioral patterns and stuff. And so we've developed workshops that are effective at doing that. And, and like um, Molly Carnes at the University of Wisconsin did the first randomized control trial um, of an intervention to reduce gender bias and half departments at, at, at Madison got the intervention, half didn't, and the ones that 
got the intervention, women felt better fit, <laughs> you know, like, and we, we had a sort of long-term result that was really promising, showing that those departments hired more women of color. So, I mean, there's absolutely things you can do. It's, that's a three-hour intervention, three hours of your time, and it's had long-lasting impact. And so we're doing that now. We're sort of partnering with elementary schools and high schools and national labs to try to bring that type of thing in. And I think you know maybe that just needs to be part of our curriculum. But the one thing, not to be like the devil's advocate, that yeah. you know I think about is so another problem is like 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 the more female dominated uh, you know position is or a profession is like the lower status mm -hmm. it is. And so so we're like oh like oh we'll just like you know, help advance women to whatever, <laughs> like, like it, you know, like women were getting tenure, <laughs> and like, we'll take tenure away, <laughs> like at Madison, you know, I mean, seriously, though, so it's like, it, it, it's so complicated, like, like, our core values as a nation, as a world, <coughs> need to be addressed, because these things just recreate themselves, and there's people who have very specific interests, who are paying a lot of money keep things a certain way. And I think, you know, yeah, maybe you can use each business as a, a case against it, but I think we have to recognize education business. Madison is a business. I mean, everything is sort of a business and who's in control of those businesses and what are their agendas? They're not to save the planet. They're not to have diversity. They're not to do that. And we need to have that conversation as a culture because or else we're just pissing in the wind. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start with a couple of the questions. Um, question number one is, if Divine's research shows a conscious intent can be subverted by unconscious bias, what do parents, educators, and managers do in order to combat unconscious bias? Um, well, like I talked about, there's a lot of different things. But you know, one of them is, is, is or I guess, like the main thing doing anything to sort of challenge your automatic thoughts. So, so you're probably not that aware of what your automatic thoughts are, your implicit biases are, but, but you sort of are. Like, you know, we, there's stereotypes about women and men and blacks and whites, like we're aware of that. Becoming aware of that and challenging those assumptions is, is one of the most easy <laughs> but effective ways to, um, you know, to counter that, to bring your, you know, unconscious beliefs um, in line with your, you know, consciously held egalitarian beliefs. So there's a lot of things. And, and like for our, our intervention that we made, our bias literacy workshop, we essentially took everything that we could find from the experimental literature. You know, Molly Carnes like pulled all, <laughs> everything she could find essentially and, um, and made like a bullion cube, <laughs> you know, of, of like, here's the strategies that work. And they work if you practice them. But you have to be motivated to do that too. So, yeah. I think you can take that to organizations to a certain extent. And and um, you know, if, for example, in my prior organization, we did a lot of training, and then we did something that was called, you know, you had to put a, a, a cute name to it so that people would remember it. But it was check your bias. So during the pay and compensation process, there was a whole moment where we were asking managers to check their bias and are you making any decisions that are based on bias during the promotion and talent process. We had the system that we call check your bias that allowed us to remember all the time that these biases are at work and that 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 belong there. So uh, I think it's slow. So movement. this is going on in the colleges with privilege and all of this these yeah, sort of discussions as well, right? It's not going to work because your criteria is priming for selection of like white men. I mean, like I know, you know, but, but I mean, honestly, like, like from a scientific perspective, <laughs> you know, that it's not enough. You know, we've been trying. So, you have yeah. to start somewhere. We've been so you, can, you have like to start. I, I actually think I, yeah. I agree with you. But if you, you yeah. know, you have to start internally and externally. Otherwise, what do you do? You close your arms. And, I don't know. It's a yeah. really big problem. One of the yeah. things that yeah. we've been doing again, because and it's problematic for me because when I took a role at an organization whose mission is to eliminate racism, that's like a pretty big <laughs> sort of. <laughs> 
<laughs> bite to take. And so, so what I've been doing is thinking a lot about how do we actually do this. And so one of the things that we developed internally, and we clearly can you know, borrow some, some, some data from you, Anna, and probably work to even massage this even more. We do two things very specifically. One is that we created a model called See, Do, Change. So C is that we want people to just, just acknowledge it. Because one of the things we figured, if people were ever going to change or their behavior, we needed to make it simple. And so, so we talk about C literally is just become more aware of your biases and acknowledge it. Do is to actually engage in a way that's meaningful for you. And then change is to like sort of go all in and really figure out how you can create mass change. But you need to sort of start with from yourself. One of the things that we did with our child care providers, for example, so we have 2,000 child care providers that we service in a number of ways. We actually created sort of a racial justice toolkit, we call it, to give them access to books with diverse kids, posters on the walls with. So just to help them. But what we found is that not only do we need to work with the kids that under their care, but we also need to work with the providers because they have their own sort of issues around race that we need to address. Mm -hmm. So I think that we need multifaceted approaches. But I do think it's the see do change sort of works because it allows people to sort of self-define based on where they are at. Because the reality is, is that no one's in the same place on this thing either. Yeah. And it is, to me, a very personal exploration. Well, it is. It, it definitely is an issue for the providers. I mean, when I when I did the talk at the UN, it was uh, the example I gave was that one of our teams from here, True. and we've been all trained by Google uh, on unconscious bias, for better or for worse. <laughs> um, and we sent a team, this was part of Chicago Cares, which is a program where 5,000 people go into schools all over the city and clean things and paint things and whatever. And so our team went, and uh, we had about nine people on the team, and it was completely mixed. Uh, team and they go and they're told to paint a uh, stencil uh, in a stairwell where 20,000 kids are gonna go in the course of each uh, year. 20,000 kids are gonna pass by the stencil. And what's a stencil? Because this was a STEM school, or STEAM these days. Mm -hmm. um, the stencil was five uh, gray men. And one was holding up a plus sign and a divisor and an X for multiplication. So they didn't know what to do. I mean, they're, you know, they're relatively polite. So they started to outline the stencil, and then they just completely lost control of themselves. And they made three of them into women. Oh, nice. And they added dresses. Yeah. And they changed the whole thing. And they're like, you know, we didn't come this far in order to you know, replicate the man in the gray flannel suit, which was like 40 years ago or something. Um, but what was interesting was that you know you discover that you can explain things to people all the time, but you can't understand for them. You know they have to take it upon themselves. And I think the message there for us when they came back and told us this whole story was they felt empowered enough, and it was important enough for them as a as by the way a mixed group. I think if it was just a group of uh, the same people, whoever they were, they would not have given themselves permission to do that in a different way. And I, and I think that that's part of what you have to do is you have to create an environment where we lean into that, mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. kind of behavior. I was just, I, I, like, as you guys have been talking, I think one of the biggest barriers to change is motivation. You know, so if you can motivate people to do, so, like, they'll do it, you know, with, like, like exercise, diet, whatever. <laughs> you know, we know that, but we're not motivating people to change. And, and in fact, a lot of the people we need to motivate are threatened. You know, they're really threatened by diversity because they're in the high status group and they always have been and yada, yada, yada. So I think one of the sort of, you know, biggest challenges we have is to show people that, you know, when you have a diverse, you know, enterprise or office or whatever, it, it's a good thing and it's good for everyone. And, and we're not doing that. You know, like, like the sort of high status people, you know, in leadership aren't getting that, but when they get it, then we see change yeah, but happening. They, but, but they have you to know? get it in the way that Dory says in terms of marketing. They have to understand yeah. They're gonna that make more that's, money. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the market is today. And yeah. if, they're, if they represent only an insular slice of that market, they're not gonna be as successful, but you know, uh, I always say that people don't change when they see the light and when the apple falls in their you know head. They see they change when they feel the heat, and you have to That's you true. have to provide. And so motivation is the good way of saying it. But you know what we were saying before is 
that you have to sort of force this or enforce it. Well, uh, and that's complicated because, like, we know, well, you know, if, if you make a, like, implicit bias training mandatory, it backfires. It actually increases bias. <laughs> you know, and so, I mean, so there's just all these, there's all these, like, yeah, things sure. that we sort of know, you know, that, that complicate. Well, the other, you know, know, so the other thing that the, uh, the Amex CEO said that was so striking to me because, you know, there's, there's another movement going on. I mean, there's the top down, we're trying to change these folks. And then there's the, the bottom up of people who we want to feel more empowered and sort of more assertive. And so what he said that was so interesting was he said that in his life, the last 10 years, people have come up to him often and said, you know, when I see you, Ken, you know, I don't see color, I just see a performer. And he said, here's an interesting thing. He said, I want you to see color because I'm proud that I'm an African-American man. I don't want you to diminish or sort of ignore that. That's part of my identity, and it's really important to me. And it's the collision of those things that hopefully will eventually bring about the change. Well, I mean, and it's because... true. It's like like people would say they don't see color, and it's like they do. Of course so, I mean, they like, do. Like of course acknowledging they do. it and saying this is what we want to go towards, like absolutely is the way to get it. And, and just one thing before you jump in, like, you know, I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but I like, it's so sad to me to hear that people's main motivation is, is making money. Like, 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 like the main motivation why they, they're gonna be diverse is cause like their bottom line. You know, it's not like social justice or like equity and like not to be in my like ivory tower or whatever, but you know, I get how economics work. Like, to me, that is just incredibly sad. I think that we need to look at our values as humanity and, and have a better reason than money. So this is where the account in me kicks in. So, <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that because actually I'm, I'm having discussions with people all the time in terms of um, why we do what we do. But I do think it's important to recognize that if you are in a job and your goal is to make a profit, then you need to think about how do you get to that. So if that becomes your motivation, I'm like totally cool with that. But um, I do think it's important. I think Howard said one thing that we haven't necessarily specifically talked about here is identity. And so the, because of technology, I can now identify as a shoe loving, yes, I'm a black woman. So that's what the marketing people talk about. But I also love dogs and I love shoes. And so now I've created my own little identity around um, who I am and what that means. I love the fact that I'm an accountant still. And so because now I have this identity, the question is, is how do I engage my identity? It's interesting that I think we're in a, in a, in a time where you're going to particularly because of the demographics and how we continue to, to um, see multi-ethnic people, that how people identify is going to matter how they engage. And so we need to understand how they, that identity portion as we look to different strategies as well. You know, I love like the 23andMe. It's fascinating though, because I have a friend who's biracial and she would, we would, we would, she would identify as black and we would also call her black, but her 23andMe says she's like 70% European. So that doesn't necessarily jive. One of the things that I think that we do need to do specifically, um, the American Anthropological Society or whatever, the, and I forgive me um, for anyone representing that group or aware of that group, but what they did, they call, they created understandingrace.org. I suggest that everyone go look at that um, because this issue around color and, and people don't see in color, it's, it's absolutely preposterous. You do see color, we all see color. But what it means is how, one, people's identity are wrapped up in that color and we need to understand that. And two, we also need to really get down to the biology of it too and understand that the, how we look is really has everything to do with our deg ancestors' degrees from the sun, but yet we've created whole identity, identities around that. But what I like to think about it and keep it really simple is that um, at some point we're going to have to get past how this yeah. matters or so, not. So you mentioned, I, I wanna take one of these questions because sure. it's a really interesting question, which is, uh, has or is social media making unconscious bias worse? And hmm. you know, we we hear every day about confirmation bias, and about how you know increasingly the filter bubble is sort of operating. So not only do we spend more time listening to what we want to hear, but that reinforces and sort of strengthens our belief, regardless of whether it relates to reality. But what's your sense of whether social media is helping or hurting just about anything out there? But specifically 
people's ability to sort of see a broader swath of the population. I, I, I'm an active user of social media, so I personally believe that it is helping us sort of cross these color lines. Now, I don't believe it's completely um, blind or colorblind as we like to think technology is. I don't believe that. But I do think it, it uh, gives us an opportunity and a platform to, to expand that awareness that I was talking about earlier for us to, to understand different groups and understand different perspectives. But I think it takes a conscious effort to do so. So I think it's a great vehicle to expand our base. If we sort of stay in our own lane, then we get the, the Pew Research, the 80% stay in this. It's like but the if healthcare we, system. It's like, yeah. like the, the bias in our culture is reflected in the healthcare system. It's reflected in social media. You know, I mean, it's reflected in essentially everything that you do. Mm -hmm. And so like, okay, this is just another way that we're able to be biased against our own intentions. You know, I wanted to say something about, not to like talk all the time, but <laughs> um, like you're talking about identity. So are people familiar with what stereotype threat is, like generally? So like, like, like Claude Steele, I just yeah, wanted to like talk about this yeah, for yeah, a second, because yeah. it's really important. Claude Steele is like a social psychologist, and for one of his first jobs, he was at the University of Michigan. And um, he, he had like, you know, part of his appointment was in psychology, part of it was in, um, you know, like a diversity program. And what he started seeing without fail was that he'd have black and white students come in to school you know, freshman year, by sophomore year, the white students would be outperforming the black students. Nobody could explain it. So as a social scientist, he tried to recreate that phenomenon in his lab. And essentially what he found was that when, well, <laughs> like, I guess I could say the whole experiment. So like, like he gave, he, like, he got like black and white students who were essentially like equivalent in their background ability. And for one of the groups of students, he gave them um, like a section of the GRE or the SAT, I can't remember, um, and said that the task, like that test was indicative of ability. He told the other group that it, it was just problem solving. It wasn't about ability. And just making, you know, saying that this first test was about ability was enough to trigger the negative stereotype about blacks in academia and, um, and it caused them to underperform. And so essentially, like what happened is like, you know, just knowing this was about ability reminded black students of the negative stereotype about ability, and it made them anxious, using up a lot of their like um, working memory, causing underperformance. And so, so okay, so so we know this. Like, like I mean, there's studies kind of showing like you know, same group of people, if you prime Asian, the women will outperform white men in math. If you, pro if you prime gender, you know, they'll underperform. So, so this is very powerful stuff. And, and just thinking about like ways to mitigate it, identity is critical. So if you're in a situation like, you know, you're a woman in a math class or someplace where, you know, you're, you're stereotyped as not having high competence, if you consciously shift your identity from woman to scientist, you know, or to a different group, that can totally like get rid of stereotype threat because it's, it's not just thing like, like about identity. Mm -hmm. I think we have to have a lot of hope because it's like when we work with identity and we say you can be a lot of different things in the same identity, like, like scientists looks a lot of different ways, then that really actually helps like in a, in a major way. All right, I have another question, which is, do any of you know of any successful blind interviewing techniques? <laughs> okay. I can, well, I can Go ahead. try. Yeah, Go I ahead. feel the orchestra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, okay, so, so my major body of work looks at the National Institutes of Health and why, um, like, racial like minorities and women have lower success rates for like, research awards. And that is a huge problem because they're more likely to do, you know, work focused on underserved groups and, and like their work is really innovative. And so we're, we're not funding these like really, really good scientists. And so, so how people are evaluated to get funding from the NIH is with a peer review process. And, you know, people are like, oh, Anna, why don't you just tell them to like, you know, blind the review process. And, and, and like, I mean, in science, it's like impossible because everybody knows everybody. And I mean, it seems like a big group of people, but like, you know, the cancer researchers know who they are. You know, I mean, you can't blind. 
And so the answer, you have to do bias reduction. <laughs> You have to educate people about bias. You have to give them strategies to practice to reduce bias. And, and, and people want this sort of quick fix, you know, like, oh, just blind things. You know, I mean, people, it, it's so, it's like almost, almost hilarious. Like, if you blind things, people will go out of their way to try to figure out who it is. <laughs> you know, and, and like, 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 a lot of times they'll be wrong. But, I mean, so, so you're not doing anything, really, probably to help yourself, you know, if you're not addressing the root cause. And we can do it. We've done it. I think one of the practical things that organizations can do in terms of uh, interviewing you know, and, and mitigating some of that is having diverse teams in the interview yeah. process. So you know, we're mitigating each other's biases. I'm not eliminating the biases. That's just something that we're not able to do. But if you have a diverse team, you can, you can work on some of that and make it better. OK. All right. Um, Another question, what role does HR typically play in addressing unconscious bias in corporations? So why don't, Anna, will you start with that? Me? No. Sorry. Oh, Irene. Irene. Okay. Irene. <laughs> um, I think, you know, if for the most part, maybe because we're interested in, in, in making the workplace better, we are interested in these concepts and we bring them to the table, but, you know, it's not HR's role to fix these other than creating some programmatic elements. But are you charged so with measuring these kinds of things? Measuring the unconscious bias. Measuring sort of all of these different dimensions of what goes on. I mean, where else would, it, where else would ways, it live within the corporation? There's ways in which you measure some of these. For example, um, you know, we've done a lot of unconscious bias training and then measured sort of if those managers were better managers of teams. And, if, you know, you, you do your employee survey in the traditional way and you ask the question about, you know, um, is my manager inclusive in his or her behaviors? And those managers who went to the training had much better marks than those that didn't go to the training. You have to think that the training in some ways is helping the right. situation. So right. there are measurements in that regard that you can do. But um, you, know, you try to funnel. Uh, we do a lot of tracking in terms of what's in our pipeline, how many women apply to a role, how many African-Americans apply to a role, and how we bring them through the pipeline in the interviewing process. Where are we losing them? And um, and so as you measure that, you can put interventions in place to create awareness and help, and help with the solution. But those are some practical ways in which organizations can, can bring some of that into. And I think HR has a huge role in, in driving some of those things. OK, thank you. Uh, do you believe that there are differences between the sexes, psychological, behavioral, emotional, emotional physical, and if so, how can they be taken into context to fairly treat people in an employment situation? People love that. <laughs> it's so frustrating. Um, <laughs> they're like, no, women are made by biology <laughs> to have baby. You know, I mean, it's called biological determinism. And it's where you take, you know, you find sort of a social explanation for a biological you know, phenomenon. People have been doing it forever. It's called eugenics. You know, I mean, you know, like, like, like it, it, it's not a good, healthy way to sort of progress. I mean, people measured black people's heads and said their heads are smaller, therefore they're not as intelligent. You know, I mean, like, like we've seen this be used in really dangerous ways. And, and so I think there's always going to be those people who, like, fundamentally believe that your biology determines, like, your ability to contribute to society. You know, but we know from like research, like women and men can do math. <laughs> you know, they can both be good parents. And in fact, if we sort of, you know, open up the the idea of what it means to be a parent or a father or whatever, you know, like in a business context and like make it okay, it really makes a huge difference. You know, so I I just that's so frustrating. I mean, maybe and and I think who who how are we ever gonna know? <laughs> you know, if, if biology is destiny. And like, what's the point in worrying about that? Because we need women in the workforce too, because we're losing our competitiveness. We're going down. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. So I've been, so because of a number of different reasons, I've been in a lot of rooms with diversity and inclusion consultants and not to take anything away from the profession. Um, that's the fact is that we now, that this profession is continuing to grow to, to help people 
uh, now again, I'm oversimplifying, I know, but to help people understand that humans are variable, we need people to help us create process around that, right? And one of the, the things I saw recently was all the dimensions of diversity. It was primary, secondary, tertiary. And I was just like, this could go on forever because humans are variable. You can choose a dimension. And the primary ones are the ones we talk about all the time, right? Their gender, their race. But the reality is, is that if you take 20,000 black women, you will get 20 different 20,000 different experiences. Um, and the things that we use are so superficial, quite honestly. I believe that we really have to start really talking to people and understanding their background, understanding what their true sort of value proposition is. I mean, no one can look at me. Yes, I went to Madison and went to Northwestern for my MBA, but I also grew up in Inglewood to a teenage mom. It's like all of those things have shaped my experiences and have shaped my perspective in being able to do this work. And I believe that we miss that because we are trying to over um, standardize our processes as it relates to human beings. And at some point, we, we have to acknowledge that we are variable in all of these different dimensions makes us fascinating. I was ashamed of myself recently. I was at um, in New York a couple weeks ago at the Fast Company Innovation Summit, and I was listening to this um, particular gentleman, and I won't say what industry because anybody can go see who it was, and I looked at him and I just had all of these stereotypes about him, and I felt so bad afterwards. I'm like, Dora, you're doing it too, right? Because I sort of judged him or let my biases come to a front as to what he could deliver from an innovative message or innovation message because he looked so typical. And the reality was is that he was brilliant and I was just ashamed of myself. So my point is, is that we all do it, even someone who's focused on doing that every day, but we have to, and I don't know what the answer is explicitly, as much as I think that it is has, has a lot to do with how we are for ourselves building that skill set to recognize um, all the dimensions of diversity could be at play at any one time within the, each individual we meet, and how do we create space for that in a workplace that reflects that. Okay, great. So we're going to wrap it up. Uh, we're going to do two things. We're going to have about a half an hour left of the reception, and also that'll give you guys an opportunity to come up and ask any specific or different questions you might have for the panelists. So anybody with a wrap up comment? Last thought? I just have something to throw at you. Like, I think science is being underused to address this issue. Um, and I, I think there's definitely like, there's always like a gap between research and practice and healthcare and education, whatever. And here we are again, like where H, HR is sort of like you know, put up to address this without any like scientific tools and stuff. And I think, you know, like they just start sort of starting to work with like national labs and, and, and like businesses or, and stuff. Like you're seeing a lot of people, like a lot of people um, kind of like being motivated in a business sense to be consultants about diversity. They are not scientists. <laughs> they want to make money. So I, I think like, like dig into the science, like call us. Have us come, you know, like use scientists to help. And, and, and I think people, like, there's totally a barrier, but it's like, we need to do it. Okay. <laughs> and just, you know, one of my favorite quotes is by Bucky Fuller, and I sort of paraphrase it, but essentially he said that um, if you want to change things, um, that you can't fix the existing models, you create new models and make the old models obsolete. And I think that as it relates to talent and how we are deploying them in our workforce, we need to think differently about that. And again, I think it's ask a different question, not just how we get the numbers, but truly how we create high performing businesses, regardless mm -hmm. of what the business is, whether it's a nonprofit or for profit, regardless of the business. Because I do believe that we're we're losing out on all the possibilities that are available to us to just to create a better human experience. Okay, great. So will you join me in thanking the panel? Thank you.